briefly introduce for the past couple of minutes while people are still filtering in. Um, so probably many of you know Ben Nachman, who's in the physics division here at, well, here at Berkeley Lab. Um, for those of you who don't know Ben, um, he's on the um, Atlas collaboration, but as well as being uh, with the Atlas LHC collaboration, that is a particle physicist, but as well as making considerable contributions to particle physics, he's also made considerable contribution to deep learning for science. Um, and, you know, was one of the first, possibly the first person to apply uh, convolutional neural networks within uh, particle physics context. Uh, and then also generative adversarial networks um, to the uh, to simulation and then several new techniques around uh, weak supervision and working uh, when you don't have labels. Um, so these were, you know, several interesting first of a kind pioneering efforts. Um, but really, as, as I know, as an ex particle physicist, convincing particle physicists to actually apply these to real data and potentially um, you know, new discoveries is, is a challenge. And, um, but, you know, shockingly recently, Atlas actually put out a public physics result um, using some of Ben's techniques. Um, so I think this is a, a watershed moment really. And um, so we're, we're very lucky to have Ben with us today to, um, to tell us how we got there. Um, so ben, please go ahead. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction, Wahid. Um, so yeah, today I'll try to cover two broad topics, so simulation-based and label-free deep learning, and I'll tell you as the talk goes on how they're connected. So let me start, um, click here. Okay, great. Let me start by saying that I'm going to talk about um, fundamental physics today, um, even though the title said science, and I think that the, top, the, the methods I described will have broader implications, and I'm, I'm focusing on this because of the, well, my background, but also the advanced advanced usage of simulations for, for inference and also um, the, the complex um, structure of the data. So I should just start with a, a little bit of science. Um, here we go. So um, and the goal of, of fundamental physics is, is broad, basically in, in a nutshell, to identify new length scale structures and, and how other scales emerge. And there are a variety of, of puzzles. And it's, even, it's important to say also that um, the LHC is, for which will be my, my background today, collider physics is not the only fundamental physics experiment. There are, of course, a, a broad range of them, but it certainly um, currently hosts the, the biggest data experiments in the field. And the prototypical example I'm going to have for the rest of this talk is going to be, um, are going to be collision events, like the one shown here, where you have protons coming from the left and the right behind all the words. They um, collide in the center and out goes this collision debris. And you can see the, the orange lines, green blobs, and yellow um, voxels, and these correspond to the outgoing um, uh, particles hitting our detector and, and registering some uh, energy signals. So I thought I'd start by um, going over how we do data analysis and energy physics, and I think this is very similar in other fields as well, but uh, in sort of the simulation-based uh, inference uh, mindset, there's sort of two parallel tracks. On the right-hand side, we have nature, which of course is ultimately what we'd like to learn something about, and we build experiments to observe certain features of nature, those experiments produce data. We then do some dimensionality reduction. And we have a sort of um, parallel pipeline. We have our theory of everything. And from the theory, which has some small number of parameters, we can simulate um, uh, everything, basically. So all the way from the, the um, uh, subnuclear length scales, the particle physics, to the nuclear physics, to the detector physics, all the way <clears throat> to make the same sort of high fidelity complex observables that we can see in our detector or the same dimensionality reduction and then the comparison allows us to infer something about the theory of everything um, from comparing the, the left and right. Now deep learning is playing a huge impact, uh, it's, it's starting to have a huge, huge impact on all aspects of uh, this chain from uh, the very, very uh, fast um, processes, so online processing data, con data control, uh, quality control, as well as um, various aspects of data curation, so that means like uh, noise mitigation, calibration, um, this sort of thing. But it's also playing a role on the left-hand side, so in the, um, these up and down arrows. So going from the output of a physics simulator to the theory of everything is sort of parameter estimation. And going forward, we can think of deep learning as being able to accelerate or augment um, simulators, or at least parts of them. And um, the bottom box corresponds for the classical use of machine learning, which I'll describe later, where we use um, various classif classifiers to enhance the sensitivity some, to some particular signal that we're trying to search for. 
Now, clearly, I don't have time to talk about all of this, so today I'm going to focus on just a few aspects. And in particular, I'll start with um, simulation and deep learning for uh, uh, inference in the full face space, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, so it's really an exploration that's empowered by deep learning combined with slow simulators. I'll then pivot a little bit by talking about uncertainties briefly before I get into the label-free uh, learning and uh, the example there will be anomaly detection. So let me start with um, the example from simulation-based inference will be parameter estimation. In particular, I'm going to talk about not exactly parameter estimation for a single parameter, but unfolding. And I'll tell you what I mean by that um, in a few minutes. So the context is that um, in, we, we want to do some, some inference. So we have some theory and uh, has some parameters. And we have some, some phase space X so we'd like to observe. So there's some feature space X. We want to um, infer something out the parameters given the feature space. So in low dimensions, you can try to explicitly model P of X given parameters and then do something like maximum likelihood. But in high dimensions, P is intractable. You know, if X is a thousand dimensions or even worse, suppose it's a variable number of dimensions that can be, you know, order a thousand, this can be, um, very complicated, and so you need likelihood-free approaches. Approaches where we can't write down p exactly. Uh, okay, so I call this the hyper challenge, <clears throat> and I call I call this for two reasons. So one, the feature space or the the phase space that we're trying to um, learn something about, that is like the collision the collision debris um, is very high dimensional. So you know a, a typical collision at the LHC might have a thousand particles. Each of those particles has you know momenta momentum, and then some other numbers like its electric charge. So it's like easily span a variable dimensional huge phase, huge phase space. And then those particles, um, they hit our detector and our detector is basically a hyperspectral camera. So it has many, many layers, you know, millions of readout channels. And so those data are then um, represented in our feature space that we actually get to observe by some other high dimensional um, uh, datum. And so this combination of hypervariate phase space and, hy and hyperspectral data is a huge challenge. And the bottom right schematic diagram is just to illustrate, not to scale, you know, the particles hitting our detector and then all the different blobs correspond to the measurement channels. Okay, so unfolding <coughs> is, a, is a, a particular challenge where we want to not infer some particular parameters, but we want to learn something about the full distribution of the feature space um, pre-detector. And so uh, this, um, in some fields, this is called deconvolution, and in high physics, we call it unfolding. So we want to learn something about the left-hand side, that is all the, the um, particles, these like the green blobs, before they hit our detector. And all we get to measure are, is the right-hand side, all these um, uh, curved lines and um, yellow energy deposits. And so we want to remove these detector distortions. Now, what we could do is if we knew um, P of measured given true, uh, we could just say, OK, I'm going to declare the unfolded to be the maximum likelihood estimator. And um, this P of measure given true would be something like the point spread function in high dimensions, or what we call in high physics the response matrix. But the challenge is that I just told you uh, is that measured is hyperspectral, true is hypervariate, is high dimensional feature space. So P of measure given true is intractable. We can't write it down. Um, however, what comes to our uh, what comes to save us is that we have really excellent high fidelity simulators. So we can sample from P of measure given true. Um, even though uh, we can't um, write down P of measure given true exactly, and uh, even though, and in fact, uh, we can't even take derivatives of P of measure given true in general. Um, so there are a variety of solutions that go by the name likelihood free or simulation based inference, and today I'll, I'll give you an example of how that might work. All right, so I'll briefly show one solution, which is just one of many possibilities, and it's based on the technology of reweighting. So imagine I have uh, uh, two data sets. One uh, sample from P of X and one sample from Q of X. And I'd like to create weights Q over P so that when I have a weighted data set one, it is statistically identical to data set two. Meaning if I compute any statistic on the weighted data set, it will unweighted weighted data set one. It's the same as if I compute that statistic on the unweighted data set two. Okay, that's great. Um, uh, however, I just told you that we can't easily compute P and Q. Um, we don't know um, the densities. And so here, the solution will come from deep learning. And it's based on the, the simple fact that neural networks basically learn to approximate the likelihood ratio, Q over P. And so the solution is to train a neural network, to simply distinguish the two data sets, and then um, manipulate the output in a clever way so that we can directly learn the likelihood ratio without ever having to know P or Q separately. So this is great. It turns the problem of density estimation, which is relatively hard, into a problem of classification, which is relatively easier. This is um, particularly useful for particle physics, 
where a collision may produce a variable number of particles which have a lot of symmetry. And uh, so here's a particular collision event that's been simulated where you have electron positrons, electron and a positron collide, and out goes some collision debris, that's all these lines and blobs. And uh, there are, there have been major advances in generative models recently um, to include various uh, effects like these, but uh, classification is well, well ahead of generation. And in particular, um, there are architectures that um, can accommodate this kind of um, uh, data. And so the, the results I'm gonna show are gonna be based on um, the deep sets architecture. It doesn't matter so much what it is, but it's an architecture that's um, set-based that allows for variable length permutation invariant um, operations. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna show an example based on those simulated um, electron collisions. So the way it works is there's a full phase space reweighting happening behind the scenes. So full phase space here means all the particles in their high dimensional glory. And uh, uh, I can't, and that produces a new data set that are, that's weighted. And of course it's hard to visualize that it was effective so we can compute one dimensional statistics and then make a histogram. So here, this plot, this, this slide shows two histograms um, after applying this um, reweighting technique. And so we're going from the blue to the black and the weighted blue is the orange. It doesn't matter so much what these observables are, but they're sort of representative of some of probing the feature space in some complicated way. And you can see that the orange and the black dash are right on top of each other. So we've done one high dimensional reweighting, then we can compute some statistics afterward, whatever statistics we like, and these two random ones match very well. And, and in fact, they're, you, know, you can compute any one and, and we verified that, that this approach works um, uh, precisely to identify both large effects as well as um, small and localized effects. Okay, but our goal was not necessarily just to reweight one sample into another sample. I wanted to do unfolding. So um, I'm now gonna introduce uh, a new technique called Omnifold. So Omnifold uh, is a deconvolution approach that basically proceeds by iteratively applying this reweighting technique. And so the way it works is we want to, we want to learn something about the top right box. That's the true particle level spectra. And all we get to measure is the top left box, which is the detector output. And we're aided in this quest to, the, to achieve the black arrow by this bottom row, which is a simulation. And in simulation, we have both the pre-detector and the post-detector part because um, we can play God. And so we can simulate both the particle dynamics as well as the interaction with the detector. And so every collision event comes as a pair. We have both the simulated part and the generated part. That is the pre and post-detector simulation. Okay. So the procedure works um, iteratively. We start by taking the uh, detector simulated um, events and we reweight them to be uh, uh, the same as the measured data. So this is one reweighting that's um, high dimensional. And uh, after you do this, the weighted simulation should be basically the same as the measured data. Okay, so then um, we, uh, we have weights at detector level and those weights can then be um, inherited to the particle level, um, that is the pre-detector uh, simulation. So uh, because we have a match, we have a matching, so every event we have the pre and post detector, um, basically the, the pre-detector part inherits these weights. So these weights are a function of the simulated data. Um, and so at particle level, these weights are not a function, they're not a true function because you can have um, uh, two different um, points that have the same features but different weights. And so in order to get around this, to make a true weighting function, we learn a second uh, reweighting step where we, we, where we reweight the unweighted particle level spectrum to the uh, spectrum that has the pulled back weights. So that gives us a true function, a uh, weighting function at, at the um, particle level, the pre-detector part. And then we can push those weights forward uh, once again, because we have a matching between the pre and post detector simulation. And we can repeat this procedure many times. So we can push the weights, we can pull the weights back. And at the end, uh, after iterating many times, we have a weighted particle level spectra, spectrum, and that uh, will correspond to our best estimate of the truth. And once we have that, we have a full phase space unfolding and we can compute whatever observables we like after the fact. Okay, so let me show you how this works with an example. Uh, so here's a, a simulation of an LHC collision. And uh, to illustrate that, this is just one observable. The observable is called N subgenius, but it doesn't matter what it is. This particular observable characterizes how uh, two cluster and one cluster like an event is, um, collision event is. But once, it, once, it, once again, it doesn't really matter what the observable is. 
this is the truth. So this is that top right box that I mentioned. We want to learn something about this, uh, but all we get to measure is the black. That's the measured distribution. And we're aided by uh, a simulation where we have the generated level and the um, corresponding uh, detector level. And so you'll note that the blue and green are not the same, which is fine because our simulation in general is good, but not exact. Um, however, we have the correspondence between blue and orange to tell us how to go from black to green. So the, the one standard approach um, uh, that people use right now is called iterative Bayesian unfolding, um, or IBU for short. So uh, IBU uh, is a binned one-dimensional approach that is also iterative. And um, the result is shown here in gray. And you can look at the ratio plot. You want it to be uh, at one. That means it's unfolded correctly. And you see it's pretty close. Uh, it's within 15% across the whole spectrum. And we can compare this with omnifold. So let's do one uh, omnifold, and that's the red. And you see that the red um, is also very close to the green, and the ratio is much closer to unity. So that might be expected because um, uh, the red has access to more information than the, than the gray one does, because the gray one only has access to this one dimension, and it's binned, whereas the red is unbinned, but also has access to the full phase space. So anything that would determine, that would modify the resolution from the other features would, would improve the resolution of this observable. And in fact, once you've done one omnifold, we can compute any observable. So um, here's a plot that shows six observables. It really doesn't matter what the observables are, we can compute anything. But the, the main point is if you look at the ratio plots, the, the bottom panel of each of the six plots, you see that the red is everywhere um, no further away from unity than the gray. And so even though we've done one omnifold, um, we've done better than a dedicated unfolding for all six observables. So just to review, um, omnifold is unbinned. It's also maximum likelihood. I didn't prove this, but actually you can show that um, omnifold uh, asymptotically achieves the maximum likelihood estimate in the full feature space. It's, it's full face space, so we can compute observables after the fact. So traditionally, you have to pick your, uh, observables, then unfold. Uh, now you unfold and then compute observables. And the resolution improves from all the other features that, are, that go into the unfolding. So that is to say that the ratio plots are all closer to unity. All right, so this is um, uh, uh, fantastic and, and I think pretty has the potential to be um, transformative. Um, however, it's, it's still early days, so we, haven't, uh, we, have, we don't have any public results yet. Um, so I want to get to um, sort of uh, to, to pivot now and, and I'll show you some, uh, at, by the end, some, some actual results with collision data. So the way I'm going to pivot is I'm going to ask a question that likely uh, every one of you have asked or been asked, which is what are the uncertainties on that neural network? Now, this is a very important question and I wanna spend a little bit of time now uh, sharpening it to make it clear what it means. Um, and in order to do that, instead of using the unfolding case, because it's kind of complicated, I'm gonna uh, pick a simpler example, but still from collider physics, where uh, the example will be a search for new particles. So this is representative for many analyses at the Large Hadron Collider and elsewhere. I think will nicely illustrate the kinds of uncertainties that come into an analysis that use the simulation. Okay, so how does the search work? So the way it works is I have some, uh, I posit some uh, new physics models, some um, new particles and their interactions. I simulate those particles. I simulate the known physics, that is the, the background. And then you train a classifier in simulation to distinguish the signal and background. That gives me a function. And um, using that function, we can um, define two regions. So one region, which is at high values of the classifier output, so very signal-like, um, that corresponds to what's called the signal region. And then uh, the low, um, the very low values of the, of the classifier output, so that's very not signal-like, is called the control region. So this plot on the right is an example where you have the, you know, a neural network trained to distinguish two signals, or signal from background, and uh, the x-axis is the neural network output, and to the right corresponds to very signal-like, and to the left corresponds to very background-like. And um, basically you can use the control region where there's not that much signal to check how well you model the background. And then uh, you can compare the data and the simulation in the signal region. And if they're very different, that's great. You have uh, evidence for an excess for something new. And if they're the same, then you can set limits on the possible production cross section of you know, whatever new particle you, you um, uh, speculated about. Okay, so now I want to think about how uncertainties play a role in, in such a setup. And I like to classify uncertainties in sort of two, two ways. 
Um, so uncertainties on the precision or optimality of the analysis. I don't know what I mean by that in a second. So these are the kind of uncertainties that it, you know, if, you, if you have, if these are large, then you are not using your data to its full ex fullest extent. You're wasting time and money, but your answer is not wrong. And so what do I mean by optimal? By optimal, I mean that, for instance, if you're training a neural network, um, then your test statistic should be the likelihood ratio. And so in the you know, binary classification case that I mentioned on the previous slide, if you're trying to distinguish, say, the background from and the signal plus background, then the, um, it's just, there's just known a known answer, which is the likelihood ratio. So if your neural network is not that, or monotonically related to that, then your procedure will be suboptimal. Okay, in contrast, um, the uncertainty on the accuracy or bias is related to tail probabilities. So fix a neural network, and I want to know, um, what's the probability that uh, the neural network value is above some threshold? And that's how I'm going to compute p-values. And if that's not correct, so if the predicted neural network tail probability is not the same as the true one, then my result will be incorrect. And you can see that even if your neural network is um, optimal, you could still get the wrong p-values and vice versa. OK, so it's obviously a bit more complicated because in addition to the top and bottom, so the precision optimality and accuracy or bias, you, also have, uh, you can also classify uncertainties as being statistical in nature or systematic in nature. Now, other words are used in the machine learning literature sometimes. You might hear like aleatoric and uh, epistemic uncertainty, and they roughly um, map onto left and right in this categorization. But the categorization shown here, I think, is, is very helpful and also um, more representative of the way that, that we sort of approach stimulation-based inference. OK, so now I want to spend a little, a little time going through these boxes and saying how you would diagnose each of these uncertainties, how you would estimate them. So for the top left box, this is the statistical uncertainty on the, uh, on the precision. So this basically is due to the fact that in your training, you had limited statistics. So you can always accomplish uh, estimating this uncertainty, for instance, by bootstrapping. You could have many pseudo data sets and resample and retrain. And that would give you some sense of the statistical, of the spread in your, um, say, classifier output from uh, your uh, limited training data set size. So this can be painful because it requires training many neural networks, but in principle, it's relatively straightforward to do that. And there might be clever ways of, of not retraining um, using Bayesian neural networks and other approaches. OK, of course, in general, um, systematic uncertainties are always harder than statistical ones. And uh, there's one key component due to the fact that if your um, simulation is um, uh, inaccurate, then uh, the neural network that you produce could be suboptimal. But let's come back to that in a second. There are other aspects here. So I mentioned that if your neural network is not the likelihood ratio, then uh, it will be suboptimal. And so uh, basically, that can happen for a variety of reasons. So for instance, if your network is not, um, uh, doesn't have a very flexible enough architecture, so that means like not number of layers, uh, nodes per layer, that kind of thing, if it wasn't initialized uh, well, or the training procedure wasn't flexible enough. And so these are things where we kind of know all of the contributions, but it's hard to quantify uh, exactly what your uncertainty is. So to put a, you know, a density on some nuisance parameters for, for, these, for these uncertainties. OK. Um, the bottom left is, uh, this is less painful. This is the statistical uncertainty on the accuracy. This is less painful than the top, than the top left. And that's because here the neural network is fixed. So you don't have to retrain, but you still have to, uh, you, might, you can still you know, estimate it with uh, the bootstrapping. And I would say the most important and most difficult uncertainty is the bottom right one. So this is the uncertainty, the systematic uncertainty on the bias. And this is tricky because it basically is how well do you model the density of the feature space? And this is hard and challenging because um, if, if the feature space is high dimensional, then we need to very accurately model the density in high dimensions. So in some cases, the uncertainties will factorize. So in the particle physics case, imagine you have a final state with like a number of particles and you have an uncertainty matrix per particle, then maybe you can build the whole uncertainty matrix by having uh, de decomposed into particles. But in many cases, we don't know the full uncertainty model. And so that means we don't know all the nuisance parameters. We don't know um, their distribution. OK, so um, this, I think, is really uh, a huge challenge. And in fact, um, right now, the way people typically estimate some of these uncertainties is they'll, they'll say have two different simulators, and they'll just compare the output of the different simulators and take that as an uncertainty. And it's supposed to capture a large, um, uh, an uncertainty in a large feature space. Now, this. Uh, is obviously a challenge because it's one nuisance parameter for you know, many effects. And so you can ask the question, 
um, how, can we, how can we see how sensitive we are to high dimensional mismodeling? Now, I don't have a solution how to make the uncertainty smaller, but there, we, I do have a proposal for a diagnostic for how to quantify how sensitive you are to high dimensional effects. And that borrows from the, um, the field of AI safety. So if you're not familiar with AI safety, it's a very fascinating subject in machine learning. Uh, and there's a, a lot of interesting work, but one area of, of AI safety is adversarial examples. So the idea here is, can you uh, slightly perturb uh, your feature space to make a big impact on your neural network? And for instance, the example shown here is imagine you, you change some pixels in an image to, to modify stop signs to make a neural network think it's a 45 mile per hour sign. So that's obviously has huge implications for things like self-driving cars. Um, now we sort of hope, um, obviously, that nature is not evil. So that, you know, nature doesn't know about our neural networks, doesn't change the features to make them um, deceptively hard to find. Um, however, we can use these tools to diagnose how sensitive we are to mismodeling. So how does that, how could that work? So imagine you have a collision event, J. So J could be you know, some high dimensional variable length um, feature space. And we train a classifier F to distinguish, say, signal versus background based on J. And I want to learn a new neural network, G, which is a perturber that goes from J to J plus delta J, um, where delta J is some high dimensional perturbation. And I'd like to perturb this um, neural network such that the impact on the classification is as big as possible. So that's like this first term of the loss. But I would like it to be imperceptible in the control region. So imagine I have a bunch of observables, O of J, and I can validate the distribution of those observables in the control region. So we can require that the perturbation basically leaves invariant um, these uh, observables. And uh, then we can see what's like the biggest impact on the neural network given that we uh, restrict the size of the um, perturbation in a, in a region that we are allowed to validate. And I'll just flash um, one plot just to just illustrate. So this plot is for some classification task. Doesn't matter really what it is, signal versus background. The x-axis is, is a cut on the classifier threshold classifier. And the y-axis is the relative discovery significance. So if it's at one, that means you learn nothing from the classifier, doesn't add anything. And if, the, if it's at two, that means that if you had a, you know, an excess of two before, now your excess is four. It's a multiplier on the on the um, number of sigmas of excess that you have. So just focus on the orange for a second. So you can see the orange um, solid line. This is a classifier trained on low level input. So that means like all the particles um, and, their, and their momenta. And you see the peak um, discovery significance is at 2.5-ish. So that's, that's great, it's very effective. Um, and the orange dotted line, which is hard to see because it's underneath it, is if, what happens if you apply a random perturbation? So the random perturbation has almost no effect. But if you apply this evil perturbation, it goes from the red cell to the red dashed. And so you see it drops by almost 0.5 units of relative discovery significance. So it's a really big effect. And um, so this basically gives you like, what is the worst case uncertainty uh, in terms of you know, an imperceptible change that, um, that would have a big impact on the, on the result. So this doesn't tell you how to make the uncertainty smaller, but at least it tells you how you could diagnose um, the sensitivity. Okay. So now let me uh, go back to this table and, and talk for a, a minute about how to reduce the uncertainties. So in, in, the, in the statistical case, uh, it's pretty clear the way to reduce the uncertainty is to train with more events. Now, this is not always possible, um, but deep learning may even have a way to help with that by uh, accelerating or augmenting simulations. And uh, this is related, for instance, to the possibilities of using generative models like GANs. I'd, I'd love to talk about that, but that's for a, a different time. For the um, systematic uncertainties, so there's the ones about the modeling of the feature space. I'll come back to that in a second. But um, it might be possible uh, to reduce uncertainties or at least alleviate your analysis complexity by making your procedure, for instance, your neural network, independent of known nuisance parameters. And so um, uh, you could, for instance, use uh, borrow ideas from fairness um, to uh, uh, make, your independent, make your neural networks independent of, of, of uh, nuisance parameters you don't know very well. Um, it also might be better uh, to do the opposite, which is to depend explicitly on those nuisance parameters and then constrain them with data. And which one wins just depends on um, your, your, your specific problem. But the most challenging is the bottom right. And the bottom right is, yeah, the case where you have these high dimensional bias uncertainties. It's the modeling of the density in the high dimensional feature space. 
And in my opinion, this is really the biggest challenge for deploying neural networks in practice and solving it will require a lot of work. Um, I think it'll be possible um, with, uh, with a lot of work from both experimentalists and theorists to try to um, identify the nuisance parameters and constrain their densities. But another solution, in our, you know, instead of trying to reduce this uncertainty is to avoid it altogether. And one can try to avoid it by simply not using simulation. Now, uh, of course, there's no free lunch. So it's not always possible to avoid using simulation. And even if you do avoid using simulation, there are still assumptions. But nonetheless, I wanna spend the remainder of my talk today telling you about um, approaches to learn directly from unlabeled data to get around the challenges that exist with um, depending strongly on simulation. Okay, so um, one of the challenges um, in particle physics and other areas of, of physics and beyond is that it's very hard, you can't acquire um, labeled data from the collisions themselves. And so there are two reasons for that. One, we have an enormous amount of data, so um, no one wanna sift through all the images to look at to, to the collision events to look at them, but also in many cases, just not possible to know. So if you look at these images, you can label cat and dog, but in collision events, uh, even if you have a very well-trained physicist, they can't look at the events and say with certainty what produced the event. Um, and this is thanks to quantum mechanics. So at best, we have um, mixed samples. So we might have uh, uh, some set of collision events that are superposition of green and red and the signal and background. And we'd like to train a classifier to distinguish red and green, but all we get to observe are all the properties of these collisions represented by balls, except for um, the color and the label. And so um, we have these two mixed samples with a different composition of, of signal and background. Um, and the, the question is, can we use these mixed samples to train a classifier? And uh, it turns out the answer is yes. There's a wide variety of techniques from a set of tools called weak supervision. So they're sort of less than supervised learning, but not fully unsupervised. And one, one such technique is called classification without labels. And uh, we call this um, koala. Um, the idea is pretty simple. You simply label everything in mix sample one as a zero and everything in mix sample two is a one. And then you use whatever your favorite fully supervised classifier is to distinguish the zeros from the ones. And actually you can show uh, that asymptotically the classifier used to distinguish mix sample one from mix sample two is actually optimal for distinguishing signal from background, the red from green. Even though I'm not telling uh, the classifier anything about the signal versus background labels. So this is pretty amazing. You can, you can achieve you know, a really good classifier without having the labels themselves. But now I wanna take this even one more step. What if I don't even know if there is a second class? Um, and so that's really the context of anomaly detection. And so I wanna now um, discuss how we could apply Koala for anomaly detection. And so the key thing we have to do is basically form the mixed samples that may or may not have different classes. So imagine that there's some high dimensional feature space and in one dimension, I know, let's call it MRES. I know the background has a smooth density and the signal, uh, if it exists, would be localized somewhere. This will be the main assumption of the, of the method. And it turns out that for a variety of um, uh, uh, very fundamental physics reasons, we know that uh, signals would be localized somewhere. And we often know the dimension with which they would be localized. So in this case, we can make our mixed samples by drawing vertical lines. And we draw a region uh, around the signal, a region to the left and right of the signal that are, it's called a sideband. And we're gonna eventually scan over where the signal could be. So we don't have to know where it is ahead of time. And then we can use all the other features that exist in the feature space to train a koala classifier to distinguish um, the potential signal from the background. And this has to be done um, in, a, in, a, in a smart way to not um, have a very high false positive rate, but there's, there are ways of doing that with k-folding. Okay, so I wanna show how this works in practice. And the example I'm gonna use, still all in simulation so far, is this um, same event I started off the talk with. So this is a proton-proton collision seen by the Atlas experiment at the Large Hadron Collider. And these two um, uh, collimated sprays of particles that go up to the left and down to the right are called jets. And so uh, the features will be the radiation pattern inside each jet and the resonant feature, the one dimensional feature that we know about ahead of time will be the invariant mass of the two jets. And that's a good feature because if there is some new particle generically that decays into jets, then the invariant mass of those jets should be the mass of the particle. And because the mass of the particle is fixed, you'll have a, it'll be localized somewhere. 
Okay. So let me now show you how this works. The, here's a histogram. The x-axis is the invariant mass of jets simulated with some simulated collisions. The y-axis is the number of events per bin. And the blue here corresponds to you know, the, the number of simulated events in each of these bins of the invariant mass. What we're going to do is we're going to draw some vertical lines to make a signal region and a sideband region. And then uh, we're going to make a parametric fit. We're going to make a parametric fit to, and excluding the, the signal region, then we can interpolate that fit into the signal region and compare our predicted background to the blue points and see if there's a difference. That will allow us to compute p-values. And if they're different, um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we declare success. And if they're statistically consistent, then we can set limits. And so we can repeat this procedure for various thresholds on the Koala classifier. So each of these lines here corresponds to a different cut on the Koala classifier, so 10% here means keep the 10% most signal region-like events. And we can still do the parametric fit, exclude the signal region, uh, interpolate, and compute p-values. And the plot on the right is our ledger for p-values, because we're going to eventually scan from left to right. And in every, for every um, signal region, we're going to compute a set of p-values, one for each of the cuts um, that correspond to the, the various lines in the left plot. So we can scan from left to right. And as we do so, you can see that the p-values, they fluctuate around, but they're all consistent with boring. So if there's nothing, you expect the p-values to be uniform uh, between 0 and 1. And so you get some fluctuations that are mostly um, uh, close to 1, uh, closely 1 sigma, which is you know, p-values that are, that are um, you know, order 1. OK, so this is great. This is, this is um, necessary that if there's no signal, we find nothing. But it's not sufficient. Obviously, we'd like to have some signal sensitivity. So now let's do the same procedure. What if I inject the signal into the data stream? And so in this case, I've injected a signal. It's the one on the right. It doesn't matter what it is, but it's some new particle that decays into some jets with some well-defined well structure. And that structure is different than the background structure. And the plot on the left shows the signal. It's this yellow histogram lurking underneath the background. So you can compare the 100% line to the yellow histogram. You see that the background is many orders of magnitude above the signal. And so you wouldn't find this if you just did the normal um, bump hunt, searching for a, a bump on top of that um, the smooth background. So let's apply the koala procedure. Let's start with the signal region on the left, and we're going we're gonna, to um, scan it from left to right, and we're going to keep track of the p-value just like before. And as we scan, the p-values start the same way. They sort of start boring, you know, consistent with uniform. And then once the signal region is on top of the peak of the signal, if you just look at the blue points by eye on the left plot, you see that you can just see the peak by eye. So the, the neural network is very efficient on the signal and very inefficient on the background. And the p-value drops um, uh, very low. And in fact, we injected something like a 1.5 sigma access, and the neural network enhances that to something like a 7 sigma access. And as we continue to scan, then once we're over the peak, the p-values go back to being boring. And then you just get this characteristic um, dip uh, where there's a, um, a signal that's been discovered automatically um, by the neural network. OK. So uh, just to summarize, this um, koala hunting approach, uh, in the case of no signal, it finds nothing. You can set limits on the production of new particles. And if there is something new, it has the ability to, to automatically discover and enhance the, the signal above the background. And I'm very happy to say uh, that We've actually done this analysis using collision data with the ALICE experiment. And I'll just quickly <clears throat> show you a couple of plots before I conclude the talk. So for this first round, uh, it, the feature space is pretty simple. So it's this two jet final state, but we're only using one uh, feature from each jet. So the feature space is two dimensional, one for each jet, and it's the mass of the jet. It doesn't really matter what the mass is, but uh, it's just one feature that characterizes the radiation pattern inside the jet. And because it's two dimensional, you can simply visualize the neural network as an image. So here is a, a plot of the neural network output in one of the signal regions um, from this analysis, where M1 is the mass of one jet and M2 is the mass of the other jet. And they're chosen so that M2 and M1 are ordered in mass, which is why it's only the bottom uh, diagonal here. OK, and so it has, whatever, it has some, some uh, um, shape. And then we can inject a signal, just like before. And it's a similar signal, so it's uh, some new particle decaying into two other particles that produce jets. And uh, the mass of those jets corresponds to the masses of those daughter particles. 
And so it's basically a very def well-defined localized um, uh, uh, blip in this plot. And so the green arrow, the green cross corresponds where we injected the signal. And then you can, you can see that the neural network, this is in data, has automatically learned to pick up uh, that there's something weird going on at 400, 100, where we injected the signal. So that's fantastic. Um, and we repeated this procedure you know, over all um, the signal regions. And we, had, we found that the, the data was, um, uh, was consistent with a smoothly following spectrum. We didn't find any evidence for a localized excess. And so we can proceed to set limits on the production cross-section of, of new particles. And I'm gonna lead up, I'm gonna build up to this last plot and it's kind of complicated. So I'm gonna, it's gonna take a few slides. So here's a limit plot. And the y-axis here is the exclusion limits, the 95% limit on the production of some new particles. Lower is better. So if you can exclude a smaller cross-section, that means you're more sensitive to new particles. The x-axis are different uh, signal models. So the different numbers correspond, correspond to the masses of the B and the C particle that we're searching for. So in general, there are four model parameters. There's the mass of the A particle, the mass of the B particle, the mass of the C particle, and the cross-section, how often this, this process happens. And so we fix the masses and then set a limit on the cross-section. Okay, so um, yeah, this is an official Atlas result that came out actually only a couple of weeks ago. It uses the data set, the full data set collected um, during the last run of the LHC during 2015 and 2018, through 2018. And um, the mass of the A for this particular plot is gonna be fixed and the neural network is fixed as a fixed threshold of 10%. And um, they're gonna be limits look like this. So this is like the 480 point, for instance, there's a point and then some error bar. And this corresponds to the 95% um, confidence level production uh, of some uh, new particle. So this means that if the, if the particle production was more than that, we would have seen it at 95% confidence. Okay, so we can do this for all of the um, signals that are shown here. There are six different models. And for each one of them, we can inject the signal into our data stream and see if we would have seen it. And we didn't see anything. And so this allows us to set these limits. And actually kind of a fun fact. Um, so uh, it turns out that for every different signal, you have to retrain the neural network because the the, the neural network depends on the data. And in fact, as you scan the signal cross-section, for every different signal cross-section, you also need to retrain the neural network. So making this plot actually required training something like 10,000 neural networks, which was um, itself quite a computational challenge. So we can compare um, our limits to limits from other searches that are sensitive to a similar final state. So that's the red and the cross. And so the red is an inclusive search that doesn't use any um, classification and we're um, very competitive, in many cases, much better than that search. And the dedicated search in the cross searches basically only for the 80-80 point. And it actually uses more features than we use. So that we expected that we do a bit worse. Um, but also it's fully supervised. So um, in general, you know, these unsupervised or semi-supervised approaches are very broadly sensitive, but for any particular model, they, they can be less sensitive. All right. And so I want to just, um, the last slide, uh, oh yeah, so just to say that, yeah, this is really deep learning and weak supervision combined with anomaly detection leading to a real physics output, I think, for the first time. All right, so I want to uh, have a la one last slide of content is just to say that anomaly detection is really a rapidly um, growing area in particle physics and collider physics in particular. And in order to help facilitate this rapid development, uh, we've developed what we call the LHC Olympics, um, which is a, a set of data sets where we have simulated collisions that may or may not have um, an injected signal, and the contestants are, are tasked with trying to identify um, the signal inside them. And we actually had the um, Winter Olympics in January at NYU, and the Summer Olympics will be virtual um, happening, it would, have, it would have happened in Hamburg um, in, in July. And this um, schematic diagram on the left is just illustrating that there's a variety of new methods that are trying to be um, as independent on the signal hypothesis as possible and as independent on the simulation of background as possible. So up and to the right means um, independent. And I talked about Koala, but there are a variety of other methods um, here um, that are based on autoencoders and neural density estimation and various other um, things that I can talk about later if you're curious. Okay, so that uh, brings me to my summary. So today I started off by talking about the uh, immense potential of simulation-based inference for accessing our full face space. And the example I gave there was on the fold for um, unfolding or deconvolution. 
Then I pivoted to talk about uncertainty and the, I categorized uncertainty as being either optimality or accuracy uncertainties. And I discussed a new possibility for setting adversarial upper bounds for um, high dimensional bias uncertainties. I then talked about learning directly from data without labels. I introduced the, a weak supervision technique called classification without labels or koala. And I showed how that can be used with anomaly detection, ending with um, some results from real collision data um, that were released only a couple of weeks ago. And now my, my last slide, so I don't have to tell you anymore, but I think that uh, it is, it's clear that deep learning has a great potential to enhance, accelerate, and empower high energy physics, as well as many other areas of fundamental physics and, and beyond. Of course, this is just a, a biased perspective and only a small glimpse into what's possible. But the main takeaway is that the full face space of our experiments is now really explorable, but we need to be cautious about the new challenges that come from uncertainty quantification in high dimensions. All right, thank you. Thanks, Ben. Very good.